I'm Brian Boyle, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the University of Washington and the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington to this Denman Forestry Issues Series program today. I want to acknowledge two people, Ellen Matheny, who is with the Olympic Natural Resources Center of the University of Washington, and Bob Edmonds, who will be one of the speakers, who is Associate Dean and Professor at the College of Forest Resources, who have organized this series. I also want to acknowledge and, rec and recognize Mary Ellen Denman and her late husband, Dick Denman, whose very generous philanthropy provided the, uh, this Denman Forestry Research Series. We're here to talk about the future of forestry in the Pacific Northwest, the challenges and opportunities and the pitfalls, and more important, the remedies. When we look at the future of forestry and the future of forests, we need to ask ourselves, what is forestry without the forest? And the forest has many challenges. Land use changes are caused by rapid population growth and climate alterations. Insects, pathogens, and fire are causing tremendous problems with forest health. Wildlife, fish, and water are major concerns, ecological concerns, because they are so dependent on the health of the forest. But what we're going to talk about here is the responses to those things. Ecosystem services, for example, which may be a new word for many people, a new set of words for many people. Environmental advances in the way forests are managed. Wood innovations. Sequestration of carbon to offset carbon that comes from various human uh, uh, effluents. Biofuels and bioenergy from the forest. And precision tools for more careful management of the forest and for better knowledge of the forest. And regulatory innovations, particularly with certification of forest. But I want to talk with you a little bit about, just briefly, about the forest investor and the forest investment organization of the future. In some ways, they'll look s similar to what they have been in the past. They'll depend on investment equity and debt. They will still sell timber and they'll still sell other products. And they'll still lease land and they'll still sell land. But in the future, they'll get income from renewable resources, from credits on for carbon, for land conservation, for rights to use the land and manage the land, for mitigations, from easements for various different uses, and from ecosystem payments and credits, not only from carbon, but also for water and for biodiversity, potentially. And so the forest investment values of the future might look something like this, in that where 20 years, in, in 20 years, it'll still, timber will still be a major component of the investment value of a forest, but why could not water and biodiversity and carbon credits and renewable energy be part of the portfolio for the forest organization of the future? And so with that introduction, I'm going to move on and I'm going to introduce the first speaker, Bruce Lipke, who's going to talk about displacing fossil intensive non-wood processing emissions. Bruce? Thank you, Brian. So let's talk about displacing fossil intensive non-wood processing emissions. We all are pretty familiar with the social roles, the traditional forestry roles of clean air, water, habitat, aesthetics, uh, even spiritual values and recreation. We're pretty familiar with the economic roles as well, timber for housing, industry, boats, paper, packaging. If you were in an underdeveloping country, you'd put up there using wood for heat. But we've got this new role. It's the mitigation of carbon emissions to reduce global warming. I happen to think that carbon measurements are going to be the sustainability metric of our future for quite some time. What are these carbon mitigation opportunities? Well, the basic feature is growing forests take carbon out of the atmosphere. That's just the opposite of fossil fuels. In fossil fuels, we basically take it out of the inventory, burn it, put it up in the atmosphere. Forests do just the opposite. Uh, but when the carbon stops increasing, meaning when the mortality exceeds new growth, 
and that can be encouraged by disturbances. Uh, when that happens, of course, we reach a kind of a carrying capacity limit for the forest. Now, sustainable management removes the logs consistent with new growth. If, in fact, the economics were right, you could basically remove biofuel residuals as well. Uh, we aren't doing much of that today. But the fundamental idea is that harvesting before the growth slows down pumps forest carbon into all these other storage pools. So we're not limited by just the storage in the forest. Now, the wood uses are typically burned for heat and power to displace fossil fuels. Literally, we've been doing that since the beginning of civilization. Use it in long live construction products. What that does is it extends the carbon storage from the forest to buildings. But at the same time, while you're substituting for fossil intensive products. So you also displace the fossil emissions that you would otherwise use in terms of steel, brick, concrete, and plastic. So carbon accounting is pretty complex in a way. You need to track the carbon across the life cycle of all these stages of processing. You have to know what's going on in regeneration, harvesting, processing, transportation, construction use, demolition, recycling, and even the landfill. Fortunately, we've been a member of this Quorum Consortium for a long time. And what Quorum has set out to do is to measure all the inputs and all the outputs for every stage of processing. We call these life cycle inventories of environmental burdens. And then you do an assessment on the impact of that on human or ecosystem health risks. Quorum has collected enough data for all the structural wood products in the four US regions and is currently developing life cycle inventories for biofuels and biofuel processing facilities. Now we have access to all the non-wood materials from a database managed by, by the natural, uh, by the renewable energy labs. Uh, they, are, they actually have a, a US LCI database of all primary materials. So let's start off with the displacement of a fuel carbon emissions. Now burning wood for energy does not store wood. It permanently displaces fossil carbon emissions. That's every bit as important as storing wood. If we compare the greenhouse gas emissions from burning a ton of wood measured on its dry basis, first thing you'll notice that natural gas is cleanest of all the fossil fuels, and we would basically displace a, a little over one ton of CO2 for every wood ton we used. Coal, of course, is a dirtier fuel, and it also doesn't have a, much of a higher heating value than wood, so we would end up displacing about two metric tons of CO2 for every ton of wood used. If I now look at displacing product carbon emissions, we're substituting wood for energy intensive materials, and that can be far more effective. If you look at the middle band up there, you can see that the steel floor joist versus the engineered wood product I-beam is almost nine, ton nine tons of carbon displaced for every ton of wood used. Amazingly, if you look at the steel wall stud, it doesn't look anywhere nearly as much of a displacement. Well, why is that? When you put steel in a floor, people don't like to bounce. So you have to use a higher gauge of steel. When you put steel in a stacking vertical dimension in a stud, it basically can be very thin material. The difference is substantial. If we look at the whole concrete frame house versus a wood frame house, we only displace about 8% of the materials in the house. Nevertheless, it essentially allows us to displace something like five tons of CO2 for every ton of wood we use. You have much higher leverage in using wood to displace fossil intensive products. So why are those engineered wood product eye joists so much better? Well, if you look at the picture on the right, you see that the profile of that eye joist is only about 60% of the profile of a dimension joist. Not only that, that vertical member is oriented strand board, even though it uses more energy, it's stiffer than that dimension product. And as a consequence, you can usually use a lower gauge. In addition, if you look at the picture on the left, these things are always cut to length before they get to the site, so you don't have any waste on the site. All of these things end up showing us a double resource efficiency for using these engineered products. And not only that, they're underdeveloped, undervalued species, so we basically can extend the forest supply base for producing these kind of products. Basically, improved designs using carbon-emitting products are limitless. The more direct the substitution, 
the more great that leverage would be. In this picture, it's pretty obvious that this wood is going to directly displace steel, which would give us a very high leverage. The Tacoma, Tacoma Dome uh, was actually built sort of to, to feature these benefits. The Munich Stadium, I think, was built more for an artistic project. Almost any kind of a construction can be designed specifically for wood buildings. In fact, not only are there no limits, it doesn't matter whether you're using new wood or reclaimed wood for many of these kind of structures. Let's track the carbon life cycles across our various forest pools. We're going to go look at the forest carbon, the product's net of processing emissions, including carbon neutral biofuel, and then we'll look at the product substitution. So what Quorum did was all sorts of simulations, different forest management treatments, and ended up showing how these carbon pools stack. Details of the chart are a little messy, so let's just average across each rotation, which I think makes it pretty simple to understand. The forest carbon pool across four rotations is basically steady state. You notice it increased a little bit after the first rotation, and that's because I failed to put in the dead wood at the end of the last rotation, because that's the way most forestry people look at things. They start with bare ground. So there's an increase in forest carbon in the second and third and fourth rotations. You can see the increased carbon that goes into the net product pool after the first rotation and another increase after the second. About that time, we run into the expected end of life of a house. Uh, and so we lose the, the first product pool that went into that house. But uh, shortly thereafter, the, the next rotation comes in and basically replaces that. And the substitution, being the highest leverage of all, is continuously increasing. If you think about that in a trend sense, the forest carbon plus that product's carbon is very interesting demonstration of sustainable forestry, continuously producing more products that we use in the economy. And not only that, it's permanent. It isn't, even though you, some of the lives of the products are down, the result of the forest is permanent. Add the substitution pools, and we're storing about five metric tons of per hectare per year, or a couple, couple metric tons of carbon per year. Now, many people say, well, what happened to the dead wood? Well, that's kind of shown in this chart between the green line and the, and the red line. When we don't use those materials, the no-harvest alternative is actually storing more carbon than the forest plus the products pool. It's always less than the all sustainable pools combined, but that's dead wood that we're not using today. So this is the opportunity for biofuels in a way. And we've basically done transects in eastern Washington to figure out how much would be removable. And you can see here a load that was essentially hauled off after the harvesting. These residual piles were put in the processing yard instead of burned in the field, which is with the way they're normally used. And we essentially got ground slash piles where, that we could measure and got a 50% addition in volume to the logs removed. That's a substantial amount of carbon. If I compare that across different regions and treatments, this is the regional carbon comparisons in 100 years. And if you look at that inland private in the middle, that yellow bar is potential biofuel removals that would, in fact, store more carbon by displacing fossil emissions. It's almost 20% of the total carbon above the carbon stored in the forest. If you look at the Pacific Northwest private, much more productive forests, of course, the biofuel collection is less in a percentage sense, but it's clearly more in a volume sense. If you look at the federal thinnings, these are thinnings which we would normally call restoration thinnings. That is to say, we're restoring the old pine overstory uh, to make them much more fire resistant. And you don't have nearly as much product, so you don't nearly get nearly as much substitution. If you don't thin the forest, the predicted fire rates, especially associated with climate change, would probably limit any of those increases. That is to say, there's a limit of how much you can expect to, to hold in the forest without them burning up. So what about these future opportunities? Well, as fossil fuel prices or carbon values rise, you should be able to collect all these end-of-life products as waste streams 
for either their energy value or recycling, forest residuals for their biofuels or their recycled products. You should be able to thin these stands, even though it might not be economic to do so now, to avoid forest fires. You ought to be able to use these products with lower fossil content. That is to say, the most fossil intensive product that's out there is the one that's going to have the highest cost increase which is going to direct you to be able to substitute more equally for that than the other products. The subs all of these things should say we should be able to increase our investments in forest growth and product delivery as a function of those kind of economic changes. If you look at all of our previous trend charts, that means all of those growth trends that I showed you for all those carbon pools are going to increase over time as the value of carbon goes up. Now there's some complexities of this for effective policy. And that's where life cycle accounting becomes essential. If you incentivize increasing the forest carbon pool alone, it's actually going to be counterproductive because you're going to harvest later. You're going to increase your dependence on fossil intensive products. A little harder one to understand might be if you incentivize ethanol the way our current ethanol legislative tax credits do, what it allows you to do is the ethanol producer can bid that benefit all the way back to the feedstock and steal the feedstock from other users that are actually producing a better carbon mitigation use, such as oriented strand board or particle board and those sorts of things. You need to incentivize the collection of those residuals and waste to avoid the misuse of the feedstock. The one that everybody thinks about as for motherhood and against sin is renewable energy standards where the utility basically has to incorporate a certain amount of renewable resource. The problem with that is it preempts the availability of feedstock for large scale biofuel processing gains. So it's not at all clear that, that even that is productive. The highest leverage complexities are to design effectively to displace those fossil intensive products in construction and other uses. Unfortunately, neither the green building standards of today or any of the carbon protocols currently even address substitution. They talk about it as something we need to do in the future, but they don't incorporate it. That's not true of biofuels. Congress looked at the impact of their corn ethanol work and decided that we need to do a life cycle analysis before we let the agencies buy these cellulosic ethanol energy uh, fuels. So the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 actually requires life cycle assessment showing that your fuel is at least 60% better than gasoline. So in summary, what's the future challenge? It's very simple. New product design using more wood effectively. It actually points to a very optimistic future for wood. But I'm a two-handed economist. Uh, as Truman said, you just tested two-handed economists, but it's not without smart policy. And I can say smarter policy than we have on the books today. Since I'm not a three-handed economist, I think, thank you very much. <laughs> Johann Heinrich von Thunen's connection to Samueling in Western Washington. Brought to you by John Perez Garcia, who is professor in forest economics and manages the global trade model at the Center for International Trade and Forest Products. John? Thank you, Brian. I'm going to task you with remembering who Johan is. Um, I'd like to start off with just telling you what we found. Okay. Um, first, um, if you just take a look at the data collection that went on over the past two years, there is a, a substantial price differential in land market values. Um, they exist across western Washington and eastern Washington, and they exist across these alternative uses. Um, these were documented in the land um, retention study. Uh, this implies that large areas of forest uh, are currently under unfavorable land market conditions, uh, nearly a million acres. Um, and because of that, if you just think about it, rational economic behavior is going to lead to eventual changes in these land uses. 
Um, there'll be impacts on timber supply from this. Um, and there's other consequences that will flow uh, basically on the services that uh, forest lands provide, the ecosystem services that, that have been uh, touched on already. So how did we get there? So this is uh, Johan. Uh, he existed in the uh, early um, uh, 19th century, um, over 200 years ago. And is, uh, he was a landowner in northern Germany. Um, and as a landowner, uh, at the age of 23, he published uh, a thesis called An Isolated State. Um, and that isolated state was the real, really the first serious treatment of spatial economics. Um, what he did was he took a look at land use patterns around his uh, home state and, and in this real conceptual isolated state linked spatial economics with the theory of land rent. Um, and so he is famous for um, these land rent gradient curves, uh, often called von Thunen curves. Um, and basically, it states that um, the spatial characteristics of parcels of land, here measured as distance from some central point here, um, is, is actually determining the rent. And think of rent here in terms of value of profits, uh, think of it as you own an apartment complex and collect their monthly rents. Uh, so that's the rent I'm talking about here. Um, but he basically constructed these land gradients uh, based on his observations in northern Germany. And because each piece of land is unique in terms of its spatial characteristics, you can use it for different uses and get different land rents. And so when you add to it something like a forest use, um, you can compare the land rents associated with urban with land rents associated with forest reuses. Um, of course, if you're rational then, you're going you're gonna to use those pieces of land to those uses that are highest and best use. Okay, and that's what he's famous for. Presently in western Washington and eastern Washington as well, we've got these conditions where if we were to measure these rent gradients, we would find that there are acres that are higher valued in urban uses than in forest uses. And there's a substantial number of those acres. What we did was we took a look at these uh, parcels uh, across Washington. Uh, we divided the western Washington area into timber sheds. And so we can see that there are several regions here where the change in land use, the North Puget Sound, for example, from 1990 to 2008, had almost a 1% uh, change in their land uh, base and forested land acres. Uh, on average, we found that about a 0.3% change occurred during this time period. So now if you plug in these market values, these higher and better use values uh, into uh, your uh, study here, um, we come up with substantially higher percentages of areas that have higher values that are not forest use values, okay? So that was the basis of beginning our analysis. And what we did with that then was we constructed some scenarios out into the future. And in this case, this first scenario here is this 1990 uh, base, and we just kept that constant over time. Uh, we took a look at that change that we saw from uh, 1990 to 2008 um, and plugged that into these scenarios. And then we made some assumptions about how fast land would get converted okay, over time. And that's this land uh, conversion scenario here. Um, and, and, and so here we've got some maps. Um, uh, this is the... Uh, uh, North Puget Sound timber shed. So we've got counties uh, from uh, King County, Snohomish, uh, Skagit, and Whatcom County. What we have in the green, uh, green um, uh, parcels here are your non-designated um, forest land use, private forest uh, parcels. Um, the darker gray um, are your uh, designated forest land use parcels. That is that these land uses are designated forest lands, and it would take a change in the land use codes to get them out of forestry. Um, and then in your lighter gray um, uh, areas here, you've got other state, federal uh, uh, forested acres. 
Um, and so based on the von Thunen's theory here, we can see how these acres would change over the next several decades. Okay, in North Puget Sound, uh, this is the North Coast, Clallam and Jefferson County. If we look at the South Coast, so this is Gray Harbor and Pacific County, uh, they have a large areas of uh, designated forest land use, and there's less change predicted in that area. So what we did then was our task was just what happens to the infrastructure, the forest infrastructure given those projected land use changes, and we plugged it into a, a growth and yield model that's capable of accounting for these area uh, changes. And as a result, we can see in this picture here that we find uh, over the 1990 and 2008 baseline, we're going to lose about um, a billion board feet of timber supply. Because of that shortage in timber supply, um, we're looking at 9% uh, decline in potential harvest levels by 2050, um, a declining trend in harvest afterwards of about 12 million board feet. So over the next two decades, we'll lose another quarter billion board feet of harvest potential. Um, the decline of a, of a billion board feet uh, from the 2008 baseline. Uh, and um, more drastically, in the South uh, Puget Sound timber shed, harvests uh, disappear in terms of a timber base uh, by 2070, uh, basically because of the uh, disappearance of this uh, private forest land here. So if you employ von Thunen's logic here, uh, in terms of uh, spatial economics and the theory of, of higher and better uses, um, we're going to see nearly one million acres of uh, forest land disappear over the next several decades. Um, it implies about 43% loss in the timber volume. Um, this loss in timber vo volume is less applied for uh, forest product mills. Uh, greater competition for that which exists, um, and fewer mills, particularly the smaller mills, the ones that are least competitive, um, and there will be significant impacts on chip and residuals, um, um, because in the Pacific Northwest, um, mill production not only produces solid woods, but they produce a large percentage of uh, residuals that feed into uh, the pulp mills in the area. So I want to end here with just recognizing the study team here um, as we move forward. And um, I thank you for the time. Is forest certification or government regulation better for managing forests for multiple purposes? Well, Greg Edel is associate professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Forestry at the 4,300-acre Pack Forest in Thurston County. So, Greg, if you would take it away. Okay. Thank you, Brian. If you, given the choice between regulation and certification, I think forest certification provides a better model for having sustainable forest management or management for multiple purposes because it provides a base for there being uh, an incentive, if you will, a market-based incentive to, to allow um, sustainable forest management to occur. Okay, I'm, I want to start by contrasting sustainable forest management from both a landowner's perspective and then from a non-landowner's perspective. If you're the landowner, you have private goods, um, meaning maybe your homestead or your house, but then also tangible commercial assets such as timber and real estate that you could sell. Um, you may be very well interested in serving the public good. You might even uh, maintain forests for that purpose and allow people uh, access for recreation to your property. But in the end, you want to retain the right to be able to cut your timber or sell your land to meet your own um, financial needs. If you're not a forest landowner, that is, all of us are in this position for some forest land, then we look at that forest land from the standpoint of what goods and services can that land provide for us, all right? These public goods and services can include things like ecosystem services of carbon sequestration 
for watershed protection, access for recreation. Um, and the public also wants some sort of certainty that there will be a, a stream of forest products, at least from some land, because they want to consume wood products, and perhaps they want to see a, a, a continuation of economic growth within their local communities. Well, this can lead to political tension. That is, the, the landowner wants to be able to utilize their, their personal commercial assets, and the non-landowner wants to maximize the public goods from those assets. Now, the, the non-forest landowner quite clearly might have some interest and uh, real clear thoughts on what they think forest management is, what proper forest management is, and they might not agree on it, but they almost always would like to see less intensive management on land that they don't own than the forest landowner themselves. So this provides us a, an opportunity to think about government regulation. In Washington State, Washington Forest Practices do provide some protection to public goods and services. And in part, they provide this protection because forest practices need to be in compliance with some major federal legislation, including Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. Uh, now, there are real impacts of these forest regulations, and those impacts include or focus on things like streamside protection and also preventing excessive soil erosion, but they also come with these unintended consequences. That is, they can increase expenses for the landowner. They can alter both timber harvest, timing of harvest, the amount that's harvest, decrease rural employment, um, and the potential of increased land conversion. That is, if in fact the cost of holding the land become too high, that increases the likelihood that land will, will be transferred into a higher and better use. Well, this leaves us with the thought of forest certification. Forest for certification provides an opportunity to be better um, at maintaining sustainable forest management than um, does regulation. Uh, so forest certification provides a set of voluntary rules, that is a landowner agrees to adhere to these rules in managing their forest. There are two major systems that are active um, in Washington State. There are others as well. But I'm gonna do a comparison today uh, between the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, SFI, which has its roots in industry, and also, in some respects, was reaction to the Forest Stewardship Council's third-party certification, which originated with non environmental non-governmental organizations, including um, the Rainforest Alliance, in response to the threats of tropical deforestation. Now, forest certification has also gained quite a bit of prominence in the temperate zone, including here in, in Washington State. And while this, the standards have become more similar through time, um, there's still important differences but both do require third-party independent audits um, to maintain certification. Well, the, the stated benefits of um, forest certification include that there's gonna be increased oversight of the forest, and that audit does provide that. And in fact, no matter which system you're certified under, you have to provide management plans, timber harvest schedules, maintain long-term soil protection, um, protect special habitats and other biological or biodiversity considerations. Um, and in fact, when you put these all together, especially with audits, it, it should be that certification provides a higher standard for forest management than do regulations alone. Now I wanna deal with two on the ground differences in these, in these standards. There are many other differences. We're gonna look at harvest time, what are the differences? There's a difference in um, how large of a cut, 120 versus an average of 40 acres under FSC compared to SFI. There's a difference in the time you have to wait before you can cut an adjacent stand, three years or five feet in height versus seven feet in height. Um, and at final harvest, this is uh, essentially Washington State Forest Practices, two trees per acre, green tree plus wildlife trees and down logs, versus at final harvest, having to leave behind 10% of the basal area uh, when you think the stand is at rotation, or if it's not at rotation, to leave behind 30% of the basal area of the stand. So I manage pack forest, and we do have permanent plot data and growth models that are tied to this permanent plot data. So we have the ability to either look at stands from data we have now or to project the growth forward. So I'm gonna use some of that information um, to just give you examples from two stands. Now the two stands are gonna be a 50-year-old stand that was planted in 1970 and then we projected it to uh, 2020. And the other is a stand that established after the Eatonville fire uh, approximately is 80 years old in age. 
Under the FSC standard, a 50-year-old stand, we interpret the, the um, standard to mean we have to leave 30% of the basal area behind, whereas with the 80-year-old stand, we, we could uh, leave only 10% behind. And our interpretation of S SFI is a little bit um, more forgiving, if you will, in terms of the, the leave trees. We're going to leave five trees per acre behind. Now, here's some cartoons to help us uh, look at this. This is the stand structure left on a 50-year-old stand under FSC after we have done the harvest. So this is that 30% retention. If we plant it with a mix of species, in this case, western red cedar, western hemlock, Douglas fir, and red alder. Now, this is pretty high canopy cover to be growing Douglas fir, and in fact, our growth models suggest that after 30 years, this canopy layer doesn't grow very, very um, vigorously or very tall. Um, and, but we do have a two canopy layered stand, and it is now a, a multi-species um, uh, forest as well. Under SFI, we could leave as few as two tr green trees per acre behind, but we've left five green trees per acre behind here, and then any trees that were smaller than six inches in diameter and planted it with Douglas fir, because we're allowed to in a production sense. And those trees then respond um, quite a bit more, and we get the, the next rotation um, nearly complete, if you will, by, by 30 years. Now, when we go to an 80-year-old stand, we don't have to leave as much behind. So here is, in fact, that 10% retention of an 80-year-old stand under FSC, planted with a mixed species and grown forward. Because there's less retention, the stand responds um, better, especially with um, a number of shade-tolerant species in the mix. And we have this two-layered, uh, but diverse stand, if you will. Under SFI, if we go forward with those five trees per acre, underplanted with Douglas fir, we, we do certainly get a, a, a two-storied stand with uh, these remnant Douglas fir. But it, in this profile, which takes a strip through here, we essentially have a remnant red alder, um, and then, if you will, a, a, a monoculture of Douglas fir. Now I've created what might appear to be this complicated table to, to talk about the yield and then the differences in those yields in terms of um, revenue coming into the landowner. All right, so we have two stands, a 50-year-old stand um, and the 80-year-old stand. In this column coming down, the 50-year-old stand is harvested under SFI guidelines. Here, it's under FSC, all right? Because we have to leave 30% of the basal area behind under FSC, we are, in fact, um, lower in the amount of timber we can extract. MBF, 1,000 board feet, 22.1 versus 15.2, and notice we're leaving 7.5 MBF behind. Now, for packed forest, we have been netting about $400 a 1,000 board feet for Douglas fir, so I use that as a number. We all know that that's not possible right now, all right, but sometime in the future it may be possible again. Um, and so I multiplied then um, these values through to get on a per acre basis the amount that we could harvest versus the amount that was left behind. All right, so under this FSC standard, we left $3,000 in the landscape in reserve trees, if you will. The difference between that and what was left behind under SFI, I believe the forest landowner could ask for payment for that, that wood that they've left behind. And a way to make that calculation would be to take this difference amount, or the 2760 that I have here, divide it by the 15.2 thousand board feet, which would yield $182 per thousand that the landowner would need to be paid to make up for the difference of the wood they left behind um, because they harvested under FSC, excuse me. So this is about a 46% premium that you'd have to pay the landowner. Under an 80-year system, uh, there's a, a smaller difference. More wood needs to be left behind, and that translates only to a 6% premium or um, $23 per thousand. So the cost of certification to the landowner are pretty large. For us at Pack Forest, we put about $37,000 in preparing to be certified and an additional five dollars to $10,000 per year in both sort of our own personal labor costs and then the paying the auditor. Um, and I think I've demonstrated there's a reduction in the revenue that comes in in the amount of timber. Now, I think the public sometimes thinks that forest certification is very much like organic um, fruit cert certification. All right, and if it were like that, then the public would be a partner in this process, meaning they would be involved in forest conservation by paying for, for certified wood. But the fact of the matter is those costs are not um, passed down the line, if you will. Um, and so this can lead to a bit of a disconnect between what the, the purchaser of wood thinks they're buying 
and what they might actually be buying. Okay, the benefits of certification. Um, to the landowner, it is becoming the non-governmental regulation for what one must do on the land, which means that this is now the social, social license for someone to be able to harvest in many cases, all right? Um, it's not clear that they're getting a premium for timber, although sometimes they may be. So in fact, we have uh, this is, as being a potential benefit, but we're, we haven't quite realized it. For the public, it should be clear that under certification, um, either scheme, they are gaining something. That is, oversight, audits, and more um, left on the landscape should mean an increase in ecosystem services. All right. It's not um, certain to me that there's a, a perfect connect, if you will, between what the, the public is buying and what they think they're buying. Although I think one can make the argument, since they're not exactly paying for it, they could be um, involved in guilt-free, cost-free wood consumerism. All right, in, in summary, um, certification does provide more oversight than regulation. All right, this is how I came to this conclusion. And in fact, I think we could look at certification now as the de facto non-government regulation, which in some cases is, and may in the future more so, trump government regulations that we have. Um, forest certification could benefit landowners if the premium was paid. And I've suggested a mechanism here where it actually should be paid to the landowner directly at time of harvest. If that were to happen, then we know that the landowner would be compensated for their certification. And by the way, I think you could put on the landowner any particular certification scheme you might want as long as you pay them for the difference. Alternatives to certification do exist, and they might include tax incentives or government regulation. Um, with that, uh, I'll stop and I thank you. And so we move to, toward our close and with new precision tools and round out the scope of this discussion. Dave Briggs is going to do that and he's professor of forest products and operations research and is the Corkery Family Foundation endowed professor at the college. He's also director of the Stand Management and Precision Forestry Cooperatives. So Dave. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do with a big topic like this is I'm gonna to have to uh, focus it a little bit. Um, I wanna spend a moment uh, talking about some motivations as to why we might be interested in having some new precision tools in the forestry uh, toolkit. Um, I wanna provide you with a couple of examples at very different scales. Uh, one's gonna be an example using remote sensing at the uh, forest landscape level and the other one will basically be looking at applying non-destructive testing techniques at the individual tree level to look at uh, properties that are internal to trees. And then I'll wrap this up with a uh, few conclusions. So motivations. One of the reasons why we might be motivated for new technologies is to save some money. And one of the reasons why we might do this is instead of applying broad landscape level applications such as fertilization, where we know in fact that maybe 30, 40% of the stands underneath that is not going to respond, what we ought to do is find out better ways so we can only treat the responders. And so one of the ways that we might improve is to basically uh, treat only the ones that really need treating. Second thing that we might think of is basically ways that we could increase value. And what we've got here is basically a situation where in the past we've focused on volume. And we've focused on volume of stem wood that is the part of the merchantable bowl of the tree that is convertible into logs for lumber and veneer manufacturing. Um, we also basically have used a system where we evaluated the quality of those by visually looking at them. Uh, in other words, surface features, which is basically the same thing as judging a book by its cover. We don't know what the internal properties are. What we're seeing is a change and the change is being motivated by some new market opportunities. Uh, for example, a pound of dry wood is about half carbon and about 8,600 BTUs of energy. So what we need to do is move away from volume to dry weight if we're gonna start thinking about these particular uh, kinds of new products. And the other thing we're going to have to do at the same time is recognize that the whole tree 
embodies carbon and energy, not just that merchantable bull. So we're going to have to move in the direction of biomass. The second thing here is the fact that what we're also looking at now is the need to get into looking at what's inside the covers of that book by basically evaluating the internal properties that are present. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time getting into those as we get further into this. The third thing is we need better planning tools. Forest planners want to know how much is present, where it is located, who owns it, and how it's going to change in the future. And to do that, we need to have accurate and precise information across the landscape of whatever forest attributes are of interest to us so that we can overlay those and put them together in decision support tools that are going to make sense and provide us with techniques to do a better job of planning. So this is where precision forestry is, sort of encompasses the terminology that's oftentimes used to describe this. And the long-winded definition is the integration of information and technology in a management system with the goal of managing spatial and temporal variability of forested landscapes for optimum economic, environmental, and social benefits. There are longer-winded and somewhat shorter-winded versions of this definition. But boiling it right down, it basically says, do the right thing in the right place at the right time. So um, that's kind of the paradigm that we're moving into in terms of developing these new technologies, is to assist in this process. So what I want to do next is start moving in the direction of some of my, uh, my two examples here. We'll start off with the remote sensing of forest landscapes. Uh, the technology I'm going to talk about is airborne LIDAR. Uh, which is light detection and ranging is what that stands for. And basically, we can think of an aircraft flying over the landscape um, using a laser beam that shines down across the landscape and is basically creating an, a collection of XYZ geometric points of everything that that laser hits and reflects back to the aircraft. And so what we have then is you can visualize that information over there that's not measurements of anything. That's just X, Y, Z coordinate data. That's all it is. But you can imagine trees, and you can imagine the ground surface in that data uh, portrayal that's there. So what we have to do then is think about what kinds of things can we extract from that. One of these is basically we can get to the ground, because we saw some of that as hitting the ground, so we can measure ground features. We can basically measure a lot of infrastructure, roads, streams, and things like that, because it will bounce off those and give us information there. It will also be reflecting and coming back from all the vegetation before it hits the ground. And it will also come off structures, uh, buildings, uh, utility lines, and a whole variety of other things. So basically, anything that's above water, it will pick up and provide some information for us. So what we need to do, and this is usually the first step, this is again uh, just XYZ coordinate data that's been color coded so it's a little bit easier for us to uh, view, is we're going to have to separate the ground from the terrain, um, from the vegetation. So we basically have two data sets. So what I want to do is talk about the ground-based or terrain data first. And things that we can see here are, first of all, this is much more accurate than traditional USGS and other forms of maps. So that we get much more detail. We can really see more about where the streams are going, where they start, and things like that. We can actually find incipient landslide areas and things like that that are taking place, such as the one in that circle there, which field foresters on the ground, by the way, could not recognize when they walked it. Um, we know where the roads are. We can see all of the topographic features. If there were buildings and uh, utility lines and things like that through this particular landscape, we'd pick all of those up too. Very, very useful in urban and uh, forestry-based planning um, techniques. The other part that we have is all this stuff that we stripped off the ground surface. And that's basically vegetation when we're looking at a forest. And what we need to do there is basically coordinate the LIDAR data, all that cloud point information, with field measurements on the ground. So we need to have field plots that are accurately geo-referenced so we can pull the data from those, build statistical models that will allow us to predict what's on the ground from the LIDAR data, 
And then what we can do is we can use those models to build maps all the way across the landscape of whichever attribute it is that's of interest to you. So if you want to look at some kind of habitat structure, you want to look at habitat structure B for some other species, you want to look at uh, height, you want to look at merchantable volume, we can create layers of all of those things as long as you build the statistical models to do it. And then we can overlay that on other um, layers in a GIS system and we've got the foundations for a good planning system. The other technique that we also see is we have methods now of taking LIDAR into the forest under the canopy and scanning from that perspective as well. Uh, that provides a different view in terms of what we can get off the bowl. Uh, we can get stem form. We can get some information about uh, the degree of branchiness, how big the branches are, um, measures like leaf area index, biomass distribution, and so forth. And one of the really major research issues today is basically understanding how do we fuse the terrestrial and aerial LIDAR techniques together to give us the most bang for the buck. Let's look at now shifting to the tree level. And one of the properties that we are very interested in and one of our biggest markets, of course, is lots of wood goes into structures. And one of the things that we're really interested in there is how well will those pieces hold a load that we place on them and whether or not those pieces will sag under the load. That sagging is called stiffness. And stiffness is the metric that's used in wood engineering is modulus of elasticity, or MOE, and we're going to take a look at measuring that. Mills have always had, for a long time, technologies in place where they can measure the MOE and of lumber and veneer in their processes of individual pieces. But they had no technology that allowed them to pre-sort that at the log or up to the stand level. This has changed. And what we have now are tools like this one, where you place the unit at the end of a log, hit the log end with a hammer, and a sound wave propagates through the, between the log ends. We can calculate the velocity of that wave, and the velocity of that wave through that basic uh, formula is, a, is an indicator of modulus of elasticity. So we've got a simple tool that we can take directly out to the log yard and do log sorting. Or we can go to a logging landing and do the sorting there. And this is the relationship typical of what we get. Uh, the, the log velocity is on the x-axis, and the uh, velocity, the actual stiffness of lumber that was recovered from those logs is on the y-axis. And so this works pretty well, and a large number of organizations have already uh, gotten into doing this sort of thing. The next step up was to, why wait until we harvest and have logs? Let's do it as a pre-harvest assessment get it into the woods where forest managers and silviculturalists can monitor stands in advance of harvest. And so what we have now is two probes that we place on the tree. Uh, we basically hit one of those probes with a hammer. Usually there's a person rather than a large bee that's manipulating the hammer. And what we have here is a time of flight between the two probes. We know the distance, so we get velocity again. So now we've got an estimate of stiffness. And these tree acoustic velocities on the x-axis turn out to be very good predictors of the lumber stiffness that we get out of the first log. And that's the lower cloud of data. And the upper cloud of data is basically the tree predicting the acoustic velocity of the first log in the tree, be it the mill log, 16 and a half feet log, or the 32 foot log that the 16 was cutting, cut from. So this system works really well. And a lot of organizations are beginning to get this into their system as well. The second technique that I want to talk about is basically wood density. And this gets back to the idea that we've got to get to dry weight if we're talking about carbon. We're talking about uh, bioenergy because it's dry weight that matters. And that means we've got to get at density to convert to volume. Traditionally, we did this with increment cores. Uh, we sent that off to a lab somewhere where the core was processed in x-ray densitometry work. Uh, to give us values that we could work. And the problem here is there's a long time lag, and this is expensive. What you can see with that lower left curve is that density, the red graph there, part of the graph, is basically not a linear relationship. That's showing how density changes with age within a tree. And you can see a lot of scatter, which is basically environmental factors such as temperature, precipitation, soil moisture deficit, uh, treatments, and all those other things that create the noise. 
And so what we need is basically ways to get at this at a local level. So we're investigating techniques to do this. One is a resistance method where we run a drill into the wood structure. When we do that in the lower right, you can see a resistance graph that comes out. Peaks and valleys in that that look very much like X-ray densitometry. The problem is they don't measure density. They measure resistance because all they were interested in with this tool is to detect decay. And so they're just looking for change. When there's a big change, we know there's a hole or a decay pocket. And so that's all that this has been used for. But it should be theoretically a technique to measure density. Acoustic techniques have also been used to detect decay. We basically run the probes across the cross section. Um, and again, the question there is, that's also a function of density. They're not measuring density with this, these tools this way presently, but theoretically we should be able to get these tools available to do that. That means you walk out into the woods, you get your density values on the spot, dispense of all the laboratory and other time lag work. So conclusions, I'd just like to say I've presented uh, two examples of new precision tools uh, used in forest management. Uh, these and other tools are improving the precision and accuracy of information about forest attributes. They're creating a revolution in the type of information we can obtain as well as the resolution over time and space that we're getting it at. This feeds directly into the decision support and operational planning activities that we can do so we can do a better job. That way we can basically we're only going to make better informed uh, decisions only if we have better information to start with. And this revolution with new technology is just beginning. We're going to see a lot more of it coming down the stream. I'd like to just mention our Precision Forestry Cooperative team um, with the College of Forest Resources, Professors Fridley, Moscow, Peter Schies, and Shandor Toth, uh, with the U.S. Forest Service PNW Research Station, Hans Eric Anderson, uh, Robert McGowey, and uh, Steve Ritabu. I would invite you to visit our website where you can pick up a lot more about what I've talked about. And thank you. <clears throat>